A very warm welcome, friends, colleagues, students, on behalf of all of us in SIGU, the newly formed, well, not so new anymore, but pretty new, Committee on, Geograph on Environment, Geography, and Urbanization at the University of Chicago. I'm Neil Brenner. I'm the chair of this committee. And I'm really delighted to see all of you here for our inaugural conference, uh, Environmental Emergencies, Emergent Environments, Critical Perspectives from the Social Sciences and the Humanities. Um, this, on the one hand, is a moment of celebration. We established SIGU just this past June after a pretty long process of discussion, deliberation, and debate. SIGU, I think as many of you will already know, is a transdisciplinary platform at the University of Chicago uh, for scholarship teaching and public events like this one related to environment and society across time and space. In forming SIGU, we have brought together faculty and students who are concerned to address the societal and spatial dimensions of climate change, biodiversity loss, and other kinds of environmental transformation crisis struggle. We now have over 40 faculty affiliates drawn primarily from the Division of Social Sciences, the Division of Humanities, the professional schools, and more. Uh, we have um, an extremely vibrant and growing undergraduate major, which we're really just delighted about. As many of you also know, we've just established a new SIGU doctoral certificate, among many other agendas. And there is much more to come. Collaborative research projects, new pedagogical initiatives, experiential learning, community engagement, and much more. So it's a dynamic space because of the deep commitment of everyone involved, many uh, of you in this room, and because of the wonderful creative energies of our students, both undergraduate and doctoral. So this conference is really the culmination thus far of about three years' work to establish SIGU, and it signals the momentum we have gained during this time, thanks in no small part to the very strong and deeply appreciated support of divisional and co college leadership. So I want to take this opportunity yet again to express my thanks to Dean Amanda Woodward of the Division of Social Sciences and also to Howard Nussbaum, who is the master of the, of the Social Sciences Collegiate Division. Without their support, we never, ever would have made this so far. They've really done so much to make this possible. So that's the celebratory part. Here's the other part. It's, it's really a moment, again, as I think everyone in this room will know, of immense urgency, crisis, and challenge. And this also really fundamentally defines SIGU's orientation, our mission, and we might say our moral purpose. The climate crisis, or we might say the intermeshing climate crises, including global warming, biodiversity loss, and mass extinctions, pollution, the acidification of the oceans, deforestation, the proliferation of emergent infectious diseases, among others, are more dire than ever. Their unevenly devastating impacts are generating massive threats to human and non-human life across the planet, and they are generating, again, as we all know, immense social suffering, injustice, and death unevenly developed across populations, places, ecosystems, and territories. And it's against this background that SIGU's faculty and students are seeking to investigate and to respond to these environmental crises by actively centering such issues, their histories, their geographies, and their possible implications for the future in all of the work that we are doing. Our overarching goal is to prepare our students to understand and ultimately, of course, to influence the social processes, political economic institutions, and very importantly for us, the knowledge formations that have produced current and imminent environmental emergencies. This, we believe, requires theory. It requires new conceptualizations and new interpretations of the processes in question. Um, it also requires deeply contextual place-based research, as well as creative engagements with the always looming question, to paraphrase David Harvey, what is to be done and who is going to do it? And that's, of course, not only a paraphrase of David Harvey. And it is with such urgent issues in mind that we developed our conference theme around emergent environment, emergent, sorry, environmental emergencies, emergent environments. And I want to 
extend a special thanks to my comrade Alexander Arroyo for really generative thinking along that um, particular frame. The environmental emergencies associated with the climate crisis are at once abrupt and long churning. At a planetary scale, these emergencies are deeply interwoven. We might say with dialectical biologists, Richard Levins and Richard Lewinton, they are reciprocally co-determined and they co-evolve. And yet, at the same time, they engender unique and emergent environments of disaster struggle and socio-environmental reinvention across every region of the world. How might we understand the deep roots and planetary entanglements of these transformations while also attending to their irreducibly particular environments, to the irreducibly particular environments where such emergencies erupt, their contingencies and also their political possibilities? How, in short, might we think environmental emergencies and emergent environments together? To confront such issues, we've brought together all of you. Scholars from across the social sciences and humanities, including agrarian studies, digital humanities, ecology, environmental history, geography, literature, planning, and urban sociology, to name just a few of the many fields uh, that are represented in this room, to dialogue and debate about such issues. Thanks to all of you, both participants uh, in the conference and in the audience for traveling from near and far to join us in this conversation. After this afternoon's keynote, tomorrow's panels focus on agrarian environments, spatial media, urbanization, and waste with leading scholars in conversation with one another and with all the rest of us. And we very much hope you can join us for the full event. Let me also just mention that there will be a brief reception afterwards in the back of the room after the lecture, so please do stick around for a drink and some conversation. Before I turn it over to uh, you know, the actual proceedings, our, our keynote lecture, um, I just want to signal um, a welcome from the Rita Kopp family. This conference is significantly funded through a generous gift from the Rita Kopp family who have made possible SIGU's newly announced Rita Kopp family environmental research grants to support PhD students and undergraduates in their work in environmental studies. The Rita Kopp family, family support has enabled us to produce this conference. Our keynote lecture tonight by Professor Holly Jean Buck is the inaugural Calvin and Frieda Rita Kopp lecture in Environment and Society. And I'm deeply honored to share a welcome message from Professor Ben Rita Kopp, the son of Calvin and Frieda Rita Kopp, on behalf of his family and his late parents. So just bear with me because I want to show. Perfect. So, so this is from a welcome from Professor Ben Riedekop. Calvin Riedekop, who lived from 1925 to 2022, received a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago in 1959. While Calvin was working on his degree, his wife Frida, who lived from 1930 to 2011, supported the couple by working in the vice president's office. They enjoyed their time in Chicago, and Cal was always proud of his University of Chicago degree, speaking often of the transformative impact that his studies at Chicago had on him. Cal became a popular professor and a prolific scholar and was also involved throughout his adult life in a number of successful business ventures, including a turf equipment company and several solar energy startups. Towards the end of his life, he and the family created the Just Pax Fund and the Rita Kopp Family Endowment. He and Frida were passionate supporters of social and economic justice, gender equality, and environmental protection. Sigu seemed a natural fit for their ideals and concerns, and the Riedekop family is happy to support its work. Sons Bill, Fred, and Ben are unable to attend this conference, but send their greetings and well wishes to everyone who is in attendance and or involved in Sigu. You are doing important work that we trust will both advance scholarship and discern practical pathways towards the creation of a socially and environmentally sustainable world. Kind regards from Ben Riedekop for the family. So thank you very much indeed. We're extremely grateful to the Riedekop family for this, their support of our work in SIGU, and we are deeply honored to, professor, to welcome Professor Holly Jean Buck to give the inaugural Riedekop family lecture in environment and society. Are we good? What do we have? Can I continue? I'm not sure where that sound's coming from. <laughs> we have a ghost in the machine. While we sort that out, let me just conclude my welcome with just a few final words of thanks. Um, 
So this conference would. Yeah, let me, let's just hit pause because we are recording and we want to get a good good recording. Tell me when, Carla. I can catch my breath. Any questions so far? <laughs> if I were a stand-up comedian, I could entertain you, but I don't think that's going to go very well. Am I good? OK, a few final words of thanks, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to the next, the next step of, in, our, um, in our event. So I just want to express thanks, first of all, to Danielle Smith, Sigu's department administrator, for taking care of all conference logistics, endless email, Thank you so much, Danielle. I think she stepped out of the room. I want to thank, there she is. Thank you, Danielle. <laughs> Completely fundamental to our ability to do this. And likewise, to Carlo Diaz over there in the corner, uh, Sigu's project and communications coordinator for taking care of all the visual and communications work, the posters, email announcements, video and audio production, as you can see. And last but not least, I want to thank Sabina Sheck, Sigu's director of academic programs and director of undergraduate studies, really my closest collaborator and comrade in our effort to establish SIGU. We have been working together on a daily basis for a few years now, generally beginning each workday, sometimes weekends too, with 6 a.m. emails before the little ones in our respective households wake up. And then we often find ourselves continuing with SIGU business after everyone else in our respective households has gone to sleep. We are um, emailing with each other. And I just want to, you know, yet again, really express my thanks to Sabina for your collaboration, your commitment, your wisdom, your constant good energy, and your friendship in this endeavor. I will, yeah, so. And finally, I can introduce my friend and colleague, Liz Chatterjee of the Department of History, who will be introducing our keynote and moderating the discussion tonight. Liz has likewise been an exceedingly generous, wise, and extremely engaged member of SIGU since we hatched the idea to build it almost three years ago and she continues to play a key role in all the work we are doing in SIGU, a wonderfully generous, engaged, and always insightful colleague. So thank you all again for being here. I look forward to um, tonight and to our conference. Gosh, who knew you were so tall? Well, as so many of you will know, the absolute beating heart of SIGU, without whom there would be no such thing, is Neil Brenner, and we are so, so grateful for the 5 a.m. emails, the 1 a.m. emails that you've managed to send. We would not be here without you. So please join me in thanking Neil. Thank you very much. Now, it's my very great pleasure to be here today, and I promise it won't be too much of a Russian doll set of introductions here, but to welcome Professor Holly Jean Buck. Um, Holly Jean is a geographer and an environmental social scientist. She holds a PhD in development sociology from Cornell and is currently an assistant professor of environment and sustainability at the University of Buffalo in New York. But I think more importantly, she is one of the most unique voices speaking about our climate emergency today. Many of you will know of Holly Jean's work from the fantastic book, after geoengineering in 2019. Now, this is a book that's very close to my heart. I read it in the middle of the pandemic while I was stranded completely alone and on the other side of the Atlantic from my partner. And the one word that springs to mind when I describe it is nourishing. It is an amazing, rich book. If you haven't read it, I urge you to go out and buy it now. It takes apart this overly capacious term geoengineering and instead asks us very seriously to think about the fact that solar geoengineering, at least, just buys us a bit of time. What does it mean, then, to think of a world, actually, that starts to bring down carbon? And along the way, gets us to think about, say, what it means to be a good ancestor, whether there's a role for fossil fuel companies in the mix, and also just how much faith we should put in kelp as well. Holly Jean is also the author of a book that I won't talk about too much today. I think we'll hear a lot more around similar themes, Ending Fossil Fuels, that came out in 2021 from Verso as well, and has written very, very widely on a number 
of extremely interesting themes. So, for example, just a smattering of her recent publications touch upon the political ecologies of mining the air, looking, for example, at a prospective CO2 pipeline that runs one from Iowa to Texas and foregrounding rural views in what that would actually look like. She looks at the unexplored problem of residual emissions, that is, what happens when we supposedly get to net zero and we've got a thorny percentage remaining, something that very few scholars have started to ask about. And most recently, she has uh, been working on the politics of platforms and what being extremely online means for climate action. Um, she's also a contributing author to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, Sixth Assessment Report, and the National Academy Study, a research strategy for ocean carbon dioxide removal and sequestration. All that is, is to say, we cannot imagine anybody better to be the very first inaugural speaker kicking off this, what I hope is first of many CQ annual conferences. Please welcome Professor Holly Jean Buck. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Neil. Thank you all for being here to participate in what I hope will be a robust discussion. Because I'm really interested in starting a conversation that we can continue throughout today and tomorrow. I'm not going to make sophisticated observations on the roots of the emergencies, since I'm among the most brilliant scholars right here in this room on those roots from agricultural transformation to urbanization to colonialism. Some of the best scholars in the, are right here. So, you know, you all have deep insights into what's caused our multiple crises. Um, rather, what I wanna do is set up a strategic conversation on what happens after net zero falls away as the mainframe for climate action. And that's because this moment, when it comes, which I think it will for reasons I'll share, could be a really big opportunity. And do critical scholars in the humanities have a role in articulating an alternative frame and, and pushing for it? That's a real question because in the field I was trained in, the work was framed more as listening to bottom-up stories, documenting them, amplifying them, sometimes in partnership with the subjects of study which I think is good and useful work. Um, and my question is whether we would need to complement it with a different kind of strategy. And that's because the background context of the climate movement right now is largely defensive. And I think we have an opportunity to be more proactive in putting forth particular concepts, um, which isn't just a matter for climate activists but sto storytellers, people who understand narrative, people who understand social and cultural change, like all of you. So I'm gonna start with you know, background on where we are. It will be familiar. This will be super familiar because where we are is the latest iteration and of where we've been for a while. This headline was from a few weeks ago when the assessment report from the IPCC came out, but it could have been a headline from some years ago as well. But one thing that has changed in recent years is net zero. And so you've seen these headlines, you've seen these targets, they range from the national to the individual level. Um, and this became kind of a, a craze or a norm um, or a meme, something like that. Basically, it means balancing some amount of positive emissions with some amount of negative emissions. So. This is a two degrees scenario. You'll see it looks a little bit different in a minute for 1.5 degrees. But you'll notice several things. One is that the red line of emissions goes down very quickly, um, could be quicker, uh, from about 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. So that's CO2, that's other greenhouse gases, which you'll see in the orange. Um, and near the end of the century, that becomes negative, and actually net negative, which is the tiny green sliver. And you also notice that this gross negative CO2 emissions is something that starts up in the 2030s, which means the infrastructure and planning and investment and R&D is going on right now. So that's kind of one vision. 
a little bit more granular. There's going to be a lot of graphs, but I'm going to talk through all of them <laughs> to some degree. This is the 1.5 degrees C picture from the latest IPCC report. Um, and so you'll see that the years of net zero are different for CO2 and for other greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 more towards mid-century, other greenhouse gases later in the century. Um, and this is just for a 50% chance of limiting warming to 1.5. We need to get to that net CO2 emissions at mid-century. Um, and I'm going to read a couple of sentences from the report, just so you get a sense of the way this is discussed in, in the literature, if you don't typically read these reports. Um, Basically, cumulative carbon emissions until the time of reaching net zero and the level of greenhouse gas emission reductions this decade largely determine whether warming can be limited to 1.5 or 2 degrees. So that's, you know, this is the critical decade, as I think we all know. Um, projected CO2 emissions from existing fossil fuel infrastructure without additional abatement, meaning carbon capture and storage, would exceed the remaining carbon budget for 1.5. So they've said in this key message that we need to retire fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, they also say that, you know, reaching net zero implies net negative. Carbon dioxide removal will be necessary to achieve net negative emissions. Net zero greenhouse gas emissions, if sustained, are projected to result in a gradual decline in global surface temperatures after an earlier peak. So this is speaking to this overshoot idea that, you know, these targets are overshot and then there's some magic that happens later on that um, returns uh, temperatures down a little bit. So that's all in, you know, the report. I think we know where we are, um, headed for 2.7-ish degrees Celsius of warming with current action. Um, and then you can look at pledges and targets and implementation of net zero targets, getting it more down in that 1.5 to 2 range. However, if you've read the emissions gap report, this is the most late, recent one, um, they're trying to be very clear that this is a closing window, that the new and updated NDCs, those are the climate pledges that get done every year, um, submitted take less than 1% off projected 2030 emissions. So, you know, these messages, that's the situation. And I think that this situation could lead us to conclude that net zero doesn't look like it's working. So one view on this would be like, we're just getting started, give it a few years, maybe it'll start to, to work. I mean, this is all pretty new development. And I think that that would be a fair argument. Um, I would give some space to that. However, I also think that we don't have policy to quantify and limit those residual emissions, which I'll talk about in a minute. We don't have this push to scale up carbon removal capacity. We don't have a credible way of matching these emissions and these removals um, across time and space. We have this frame of net zero, which is really silent on phasing out fossil fuels. Um, and so even though the IPCC starts to acknowledge that necess necessity, it's not within the net zero framework. And really the story about net zero is like a boring mathematical thing for most people. So I'm gonna talk about each of those in turn. Um, these reasons why net zero is not working will be the first part. And then in the second part, I'm gonna talk about some ideas for what a new frame could be to replace net zero. So, starting with these residual emissions. Um, so this plot is just C it's CO2 equivalent. So you can see the colored ones are CO2 from transport, energy, land use. The white part at the top is the other greenhouse gas emissions. And what they've done in this latest report is look at different ways to achieve net zero CO2. And so these are the residual emissions in these different scenarios. You can see that the CO2 emissions get up towards, you know, somewhere between a couple billion tons to towards 10 billion tons. And if you want to also tackle the non-CO2 emissions, some of those scenarios are getting more towards 20 at, at the minimum, probably seven or eight. So all of that is to say that the different scenarios, pathways look, looked at um, by the IPCC all have some amount of residual emissions 
largely from um, transport. And also the energy sector is doing a lot of work on the um, carbon removal side in many of these scenarios as well. So why are there leftover emissions at net zero? This is a different look at that question. Um, rather than using the sort of integrated assessment models that the IPCC uses, these analysts said, okay, what if we tried really hard to reduce everything we could using you know, the technologies that we think will come online? Um, and they had a much smaller number than those you know, seven, eight, 10, 20 gigatons. They, they put our hard to avoid emissions at between 1.5 to 3.1 gigatons, which really is a big difference from some of the modeling. And most of this is from agricultural nitrous oxide, um, as well as some from aviation. And some of these maybe with new technologies we can bring down ev even further, but this is a much more ambitious look on the question of how many residual emissions we could expect. And so different countries have different long-term climate strategies. This is from the US one, um, published at the end of 2021. It basically says, this is what we're gonna try to do, reduce to get to net zero in 2050. Um, it had some look at residual energy emissions. A lot of these strategies are not super clear on the projections of residual emissions, but you can see that they expect there to be some leftover industrial emissions, some transport. Um, the electricity sector does get to zero. And my colleagues and I read through all these different long-term strategies. Basically, the context for this is that under the Paris Agreement, countries are invited to submit, well, they should strive to formulate and communicate long-term low greenhouse gas emission development strategies. Basically, if you have a net zero target, this would be your plan for reaching that. These are supposed to go towards mid-century and possibly beyond. And um, so far, just about 50 plus a couple, maybe 51 or 52 by now, have submitted these strategies to the UN. Um, a few of them include their projections of residual emissions. Only a few of them break these down by sector, but uh, we looked at these to calculate you know, we have all these models about leftover emissions at net zero. What are countries actually planning for? What are they willing to put on paper in these projections? Um, many of these strategies have multiple scenarios. Again, just kind of like the, the IPCC approach of having different scenarios. So we only looked at actually the lowest, most ambitious ones. And even with those absolute lowest ones, um, they still had a fair amount of residual emissions, around 18% on average um, for the higher income countries. And so this is a, a big problem, as, as we talk about, um, because we don't have the removal infrastructure to compensate for these large volumes of continued emissions. If you're curious about where they're coming from, a lot of it is from agriculture, some amount from industry. You can read the paper if you're curious on these uh, details, but you're probably not. So um, it gets pretty wonky. I apologize for that. The main point is that we need a consistent definition of residual emissions, um, as well as some process to standardize the expectations around how many residual emissions there would be at net zero. Because otherwise you have you know, people just calling different sorts of emissions hard to abate, assuming they're gonna be able to invent carbon removal technology to deal with it. And um, if you have a projection of residual emission, you can send a clear signal about how long we expect to be using fossil fuels for. Basically, we also don't have a real effort to scale carbon removal to climate significant levels. I saw a headline the other day um, from Reuters or AP or one of the big news organizations that the Biden administration was betting big on direct air capture because we have these direct air, air capture hubs funded for $3.5 billion um, under the bipartisan infrastructure law. But those sorts of things are really a tiny drop in the bucket compared to any sort of scale, even, even that you would need to compensate for a gigaton or two of CO2. Um, there's really not been a major push. Most countries didn't even really mention carbon removal in their long-term strategies. Um, and I'm just gonna go through 
what we mean when we talk about carbon removal. Um, for clarity, in case people aren't familiar, basically in these net zero scenarios, carbon removal is playing different sorts of roles. One is to compensate for some amount of CO2 emissions, also to compensate for these other greenhouse gas emissions like um, methane and nitrous oxide. Um, and in many scenarios, it's also compensating for, for historical emissions, so removing emissions from past years. Um, there's a lot of different techniques you may be familiar with. Some of these, like soil carbon sequestration or reforestation, are more familiar. Um, Ecosystem-based, there's also geological techniques, and, and as well as some more kind of frontier, basic stage research techniques, like enhanced rock weathering or fertilizing the oceans to grow, grow plankton that would then sink down and die. I'm gonna talk a minute about the engineered um, techniques first. Biomass carbon removal and storage is something that's in a lot of the climate modeling. Well, I should be more precise, integrated assessment modeling. Um, and basically it was added to these models to get them to solve for these particular targets, but a lot of the scientists don't really recognize these as credible scenarios because of the land demands for bioenergy um, in many of them are very high. However, the, the field is moving a bit from these kind of earlier modeling-based assumptions to actually experimenting with some interesting things like using um, forest biomass from forest thinning for fire prevention, for example, gasifying it, using it for hydrogen, as well as storing the CO2. There's some pilot research in that area um, that could be interesting. The other one I'll mention in more detail is direct air capture. Um, you may have seen some of the announcements of pilot facilities and, of course, these, these hubs that are being built. Um, or at least planned, we'll see how many of them are built. Um, but they have a, a large energy cost right now. So if you were thinking about this 10 billion tons of direct air capture, that would require one and a half times the wind and solar capacity that we would need in a, a low carbon scenario or something like 1200 nuclear power plants. Um, and so that's, you know, right now it's early stage technology. We could expect that it might become more efficient. People are working on that, but right now, um, the, the picture is challenging for, for scaling this up. You could also think about the land requirements for the renewables that would need, be needed to power this sort of industry. Um, the direct air capture itself doesn't have a huge land footprint, but the solar and wind could start to add up. Um, so we have these demonstration projects that are trying to improve the technology. These are some of the ones, places that have um, announced an intent to apply for this federal funding. There'll, there'll be four such hubs that are funded. Um, but all of this, both the bioenergy with CCS and the direct air capture with CCS is underpinned by basic geologic storage capacity, which we have capacity probably um, but the infrastructure is something on the scale of the existing oil and gas industry. If you think about the transportation, if you think about injection, compression, all of that stuff that goes on. Um, so this is why it would be better not to assume that we could aim to draw down 10 billion tons of CO2 with direct air capture. There's just a lot of um, challenges there. We need to really get the residual emissions as small as possible, I'm sure you all think about that a lot too. Um, and people normally look at this and then they ask, well, what about natural climate solutions? Can we just avoid all of this industrial stuff and plant more trees? Um, we definitely should be making a big afforestation effort, but we still have a lot of demands for land and that becomes problematic. So, um, so we have to limit the scale of removals. We have to think about you know, how to make those sustainable and socially beneficial. That work is not really going on. There's also not a credible regime, regime for matching these emissions and these removals. Um, I think people know that carbon markets don't work and I probably don't have to explain that to this crowd, but it's just interesting how net zero is, it's not just a policy project, it's like a, 
a knowledge project because it, it implies that you can know and track the positive emissions. We're getting better at that. We have new tools like satellites that can track emissions, for example. Um, but that there's some absolute knowability of that. And then also that you can know the carbon removals, which is really challenging for some of these techniques uh, as well. And then that there's going to be a platform to connect all of that. Um, and this is just for context about venture capital spending on some of these technologies. Um, the point is that there's been new investment in a sector which used to be called clean tech is now called climate tech. Most of that is going into transportation and energy. On the far side of this, you see some investment in carbon removal. Um, and to get more granular on that, it's, it's not very much compared to these other things. But a lot of this, uh, the deals going on are really on the um, side of making a marketplace. So figuring out what the software looks like to track these removals and to track these emissions. And so, you know, this makes sense from a VC tech perspective because it's easier to invest in software and scale that than to invest in heavy fixed capital infrastructure stuff. Um, so it makes you wonder how much of the carbon removal hype and activity is really just about being the one to build the right platform and extract value from the, the flows, basically. Um, and I have a, a brief article about that if you're interested. But basically, I think that despite all the investment in these platforms and in remote sensing technologies and in this vision of being able to track everything with kind of a planetary computer. Um, there's still both technical and governance barriers to having accurate information about all of this in the timelines that are relevant for the challenge um, that we face right now. Finally, I think that the fact that this frame is silent on phasing out fossil fuels, you know, was a desirable design feature because it has this strategic ambiguity. Um, and allows actors to not having to make strong commitments there, but ultimately it's a problem for the frame. Um, and we've seen how the, the net zero idea has this flexibility. This is from Aramco's uh, website. You know, they're thinking about these four R's. You can reuse CO2 and turn it into products. You can remove it from the atmosphere. You can recycle it, all this stuff, right? This is another schematic. This is from a, an industry called Fred Sosa some years ago now um, from Occidental Petroleum. Um, probably it was Oxy Low Carbon Ventures, actually, their kind of branch that deals with this. But the idea is that you have direct air capture. You inject that CO2 underground as part of enhanced oil recovery to get more oil up. And then you can keep the plane flying, and it's OK. Um, so <laughs> net zero as a goal really doesn't tell you about what it's like to live in a net zero world and about the features of that in, in many different senses. Um, it doesn't tell you if you have a net zero world where massive carbon removal um, in all of these different techniques and places compensates for ongoing emissions and net zero is just kind of your permanent state that you figure out the balance and you go with that balance. And that way it kind of resonates with the sustainability discourse. Um, or is it a world that's actually ending fossil fuels? We know from the production gap report and other studies that we're not on track to um, do this production consistent with these goals. But you could imagine that net zero is a temporary state that we pass through at mid-century on the way to a fuller zero. Um, by 2100. Or you could imagine that we have a net zero world where fossil fuel companies are pivoting to petrochemicals, which some of them are interested in doing. And then we have all these petrochemical products to deal with. Or you could imagine that there's a net zero world that actually ends extraction and moves to carbon utilization and biomaterials and builds this kind of circular economy in a genuine sense. And so which world we end up with depends obviously on policy, but it also depends more fundamentally on the stories we tell and the language we use um, about what we're doing with all of this. Um, 
so which brings me to the final flaw with net zero is that I don't think it's very compelling to people outside of like software people <laughs> or like people who you know do corporate sustainability stuff. Um, you know, you don't meet people that are really inspired about getting to, to net zero outside of those kind of spheres. And right now we have these different fragmented stories because climate action is broken down by sector. This is from the International Energy Agency, which helpfully tells us all the things that we need to do. Um, and obviously the wedges have been useful in breaking apart the problem into something we can wrap our heads around. But also um, it's a fragmented storyline. And you could have desirable objects or desirable outcomes in each sector, um, you know, in the building sector, in transport, in industry, but they don't seem to add up to a full narrative that's both gripping and communal. Um, and so we know climate action requires demand actually from people um, for new infrastructures and new practices. Those could be familiar, you know, consumer things, but also, um, actually doing things differently. Farmers have to want to farm in ways that, you know, put carbon into the soil or um, are emissions free, for example. Um, and that demand isn't just about uh, people or businesses or consumers, it really has to do with translating to votes for supportive policies. So we managed to get, for example, this um, tax credit, which, in, People could have different opinions on this, and I would understand all of them, but it, it was a bipartisan thing that kind of worked because you had people that are in more an energy-friendly, traditional energy-friendly states that would vote for it, as well as um, climate hawks on, on the, the Democrat side. And they came together, and we have this you know, tax credit for putting CO2 underground, um, where you can also benefit from some of the enhanced oil recovery stuff as well. So you have you know, people willing to vote for that and have legislators that do that, but how many things are we in that situation? Um, and we need policies that actually deliver real benefits for all of these energy technologies. We have opposition to um, you know, things that I think people here would probably resonate with, like the CO2 pipelines or maybe the lithium mines, but also to transmission lines and solar and wind um, all around. Because I think it's not just that people are tricked by the fossil fuel industry into opposing these things. It's because they're not seeing felt benefits where they live. They're seeing the revenue go to distant places and they're living with um, this. So... Net zero, basically, inadequate story about what it is like to live in a desirable future. Um, governance by curve, which I think is what we're facing when we try to, you know, make things fit the curve. We did this to, to varying uh, degrees with the pandemic as well. Um, I think that the curve is understandable because it mirrors the basic narrative curve where you have... Um, you know, this rising action, you have this climax, you have us kind of the hero at this critical decade. I mean, this is the story that I was telling too, um, where we resolve things and then you have this falling action and then it's fine. Um, but if you're just telling that story in a graph form, it, it doesn't reach people. So will we have a collapse of net zero as a goal? What would that look like? How would you know? I think that you may see some companies backing away from targets. You may see, well, we've already seen reports of targets not being on track. Um, you may see people switch from net zero greenhouse gas to net zero CO2 as a goal. Is net zero too big to fail? Maybe, but I do think the confidence in it will be eroded to the point where there's a big opportunity for a next thing. So what should that next thing be? Um, and the basic question is what actually makes a good frame um, for climate action or climate policy? This is what I'm going to put on the table. I'm not sure if it's right. I would really love to hear from everybody what you think um, are the desirable qualities of a better frame than net zero. The ones I came up with were that it measures progress towards a goal. 
Um, I think that's important, but I don't think we need this obsession with metrics that we sometimes see. Um, a compelling story, hopefully with affect. I'd like to see frames that go beyond the narrow carbon lens. I think that's been a big hindrance. We have a lot of other ecological crises um, to focus on as well. I think that the frame does need to enable broader political coalitions. Um, this may be a point of uh, tension, but I think that's necessary. I think it helps if it works on multiple scales. That was one of the effective things about net zero. You saw it on the municipal, the nation state, international, and so on. Um, and that it, it presents an opening towards a post-capitalist future. How do you do that when you're also trying for number four? I think it's a challenge. Why not be explicitly anti-capitalist right up front? Um, I wanted to throw in a brief reference to Eric Allen White's uh, short book. Um, because, because he's thinking about strategy and he's thinking about these different sorts of anti-capitalist strategies, including you know, smashing capitalism, escaping it, dismantling it. How do you go about it? Um, I think that the media ecology that we are in and also um, the ways in which states can wield power demand some kind of staged or scaffolded approach towards an anti-capitalist society. So if you're wondering why uh, my language in here is not as radical as it could be, that's the basic reason. Um, I was also thinking about this paper and some of the research in this vein. This was a really interesting study by Gustafsson et al. Um, back from 2019, where they, they had a time series look at what people thought about the Green New Deal. Um, you know, kind of before people had heard about it and then after it had been discussed in the media. And they saw, you know, actually Republicans supported this idea before it came into the Fox News world and then support dropped dramatically. They, they actually traced what they call a Fox News effect because they looked at the exposure to different news sources. Um, and so what this says to me is that, you know, the media environment is basically one where wherever you have a frame, it's going to be um, distorted. And that's another reason why I'm not leading with anti-capitalism as the, the way forward here. Um, but I do think that we can think about specific things to measure in terms of what a new frame would be, and also think about broader languages to talk about these developments. And so I will talk about each of these in turn. Um, like I mentioned, we don't know if net zero is supposed to be temporary, is it supposed to be permanent? We have things like coal plant closures, um, but how are we going to decommission the whole system, all of the pipelines, the gas stations, the um, infrastructure in people's homes? Um, I think phasing out fossil fuels is something that you can measure and work towards. I think it's a multi-dimensional challenge. I talk about these different aspects of it in my book. Um, geopolitics is, I think, the one that keeps me up at night the most alongside political power. Um, because we have a lot of countries that are highly reliant on fossil fuel uh, for a good portion of their economies. Um, and so just putting that challenge on the table, I still think it's worth making it an explicit goal. I think there's a lot of different policies we could use. All of these are also in my book. I don't think any of them is like the perfect option, but if you combine them in different ways at different times, that's the, the way I see to move towards that goal. I also think we could do a much better job of scaling up um, clean energy as a particular goal. I think that COVID-19 showed how quickly we can put together dashboards and knowledge product, products to track what's going on. And so why don't we have a dashboard that's telling us about the clean energy that we're scaling up, about what we're phasing out, um, just to pull people together on a project. I refer in the next few slides to this report on um, by people at Princeton called Net Zero America. It's like a 300 plus page slide deck, um, but worth checking out. And 
you know, they, they spell out in, in a spatially explicit way as well as a quantitative way different scenarios um, for what we will need to do to scale clean energy. Basically, it grows a lot in all of the scenarios they look at. Um, the current state, as you're probably familiar with, is that wind and solar are just a tiny percentage of uh, energy right now, the world is still very reliant on coal, oil, and gas, even though we are ramping up renewables much faster than people projected that we could. Um, this is still the picture. So I'm going to talk about some constraints on progress to have them um, on the table. The first one is just scaling up energy storage, investing more in that. That's something that we could be tracking as a goal. Um, and building, you know, everyday familiarity with it. Um, I think that we have roadmaps like this one um, from NREL, the National Lab, about how to get there. But all of this still is extremely obscure to people. So, so a lot of work to be done on, on the tech and communication side there. Minerals, I think a lot of you probably work on critical minerals um, and mining and extraction in this room, but the projections for the mineral demand, you know, between four and six times um, what we have now are another big challenge. Um, I would just put a pitch, if, if, you're, if you're interested in modeling, to look at this re report by the Climate and Community Project, because this is one of the first attempts I've seen to actually put social demand in a better way into different scenarios about what's actually required. So they looked at, you know, what if people took more trips by biking and walking and public transport, could you get these numbers of demand for lithium lower? Um, but still, the, the, the land demands for renewables are another challenge. So this is from one of the scenarios that excludes um, carbon capture and storage. It's the most renewable scenario. And you'll see to achieve that, if we don't want carbon capture and storage, they model wind turbines across the whole eastern seaboard, across a lot of the middle states, big demand for um, solar as well. You can see uh, this in a different setup here, which compares their different scenarios. So the RE plus is the one we were just looking at, but all of them really do have um, a lot of land required. So this is a project that requires really communicating well with people in rural areas and de delivering actual benefits from hosting these infrastructures where they live. Financing is another big challenge. I kind of put the numbers here for reference. Um, this is the most boring part of this whole talk, I apologize. But it's good to, to know that, you know, the bright side is we are um, going past a trillion uh, in low carbon energy tech investment. Um, still, we need more, as you would guess. Um, some of these scenarios are very capital intensive. Um, we're looking at trillions of, of investment. The, Recent legislation did a little bit. We need a lot more. Okay, Workforce, finally another constraint and something we could be measuring and focusing on much more than we are. Um, the percentage of people in uh, energy supply is projected to rise. We need to make a really big effort in training people. And I'm pitching that because I know many of you work at universities. Um, and then social contestation. So we've seen a lot of local policies restricting renewables, um, a lot of contested renewable facilities. Um, and the interconnection queue. So this is probably the last challenge I, I'm going to highlight. Um, we have this really huge backlogged queue of projects that want to connect to the grid. Um, they have to do these impact studies before they can actually be built to determine how they will affect the grid. Um, and it just takes too long. Most projects walk away because of that time limit and other things. Um, and so like, there's a question, why don't we have people out there protesting to deal with the interconnection queue? 
I mean, it, it's a wonky thing, but it's really important. Um, and so that demands to me a reorientation of some of where we are in the climate movement. Um, the main point with all of these constraints is not to make people depressed. It's that we need better research because I've showed you a bunch of re research that is kind of general modeling. A lot of that does not incorporate people and their choices and their agency um, and their behavior and all of that. We could fix that at, you know, through interdisciplinary research of the kinds we all do. And um, we could make all of those constraints as things that we track within kind of the new frame. Another thing we could be tracking, adaptation progress. We know it's not uh, adequate. We know that you know, countries have promised and not delivered. Um, there are more plans around adaptation than in previous years, um, but the, the flows have not really uh, materialized and not enough implementation. Another thing to focus on would be just the capacity of states to plan and direct a transition. This is something that's trickier to measure. I don't have a suggested metric right now, but having read all of these long-term strategies, it's really striking that um, many of these are like written by consultants. It's not clear that they have governmental buy-in, you know, within the different ministries or agencies or departments of government. Um, it's not clear they've had these stakeholder processes, but you know, is there really buy-in from different parts of society? There's very few agencies that are dedicated to long-term planning besides the military. So where does road mapping happen? Are there expertise and resources for this kind of planning? That's something that could be measured, like how many people do we have thinking about long-term stuff in our government or our institutions? Um, you know, I don't know if these plans will be followed, but it's good that like we at least had the idea to to make some roadmaps. Um, finally, you know, we could be tracking action on both social and technological breakthroughs when it comes to decarbonization. Um, why do I talk so much about technology? I think that mitigation requires lots of new technologies um, in the food sector in um, buildings and all sorts of things. And those are really entwined with behavioral changes. You know, learning to eat different sorts of foods, making that a norm, learning to climatize your house differently, learning to have different kinds of appliances and run them in different times and all of this stuff. And so I think that, you know, this tech change, social change is um, at least a misleading binary. You can look at some of the modeling that um, thinks about how to be more ambitious um, without using technology. This is a, a modeling paper that looked at how to get to 1.5C without um, using net negative emission technologies. They couldn't actually do it, but they could reduce the need for it. But the assumptions in this paper, if you read the supplementary information, they're thinking about, um, you know, they got it down to the calorie, maybe like half a bite per day of beef, um, you know, reduced air travel, many of these things people here are on board with and working on, but um, a lot of challenges there. So the tech is actually mixed up with the behavioral change. Um, and so this is a, a brief digression as I work towards the end of this talk here. I think that how we think about climate action is structured by binaries that serve functions both in popular discourse and sometimes in identity expression. And I think these are all familiar binaries. Why am I bringing this up now? I think it's because they create a lack of clarity and also keep us from being effective in our work sometimes. Um, you know, many of these things like growth versus degrowth, obviously we need to grow some things and degrow other things. I don't think we necessarily need both geoengineering and mitigation, but I do think that the binary sets up a false idea of what's required for, for some of this. Um, so the way I've come to think about mitigation through, through my work, um, as I delve more into fossil fuels and, and decarb and industrial decarbonization and all of that, I see it as planetary in scale, as world remaking, 
which in some ways is like geoengineering. I see it requiring significant land use change and infrastructure, even with different sorts of pathways. It clearly requires new forms of planning and new institutions. And if we frame this work simply as emissions cuts, emissions cuts kind of implies doing less of something. I think that's disingenuous and we need to be much more forward about the nature of, of the work to different people. So these, this is a caution um, about these binaries. I think that the function of them in, in the media, the ecosystem that we're in, is to drive engagement and hence profit, um, you know, maximizing time on site. And these particular things that I work on, like carbon removal, um, are extremely <laughs> influenced by this because the discourse that is polarized within a group, the algorithms seem to really love this. I think that if you are debating with like um, somebody on the opposite side of the political spectrum, you're gonna lose interest in that because you don't really care what that person thinks at the end of the day. You're, you're able to write them off, but if it's your group of peers, you do care. Um, you do want to you know, have a, an interaction with them. I think that there's similar things going on sometimes in academia because academia has its own incentive slash influencer structures. Um, I think that all of this is increasingly important because we have the situation with the neoliberalized university where social capital kind of has to stand in for actual capital. When people are precarious, they need to engage in these different ways. Um, and the results of this, you know, I think it inhibits formation of collective political actors. We lose time that we could be focusing on strategy and wider movement building. Um, and I think that ego is actually the main obstacle to climate action um, at the root. So that's a caution. That's what we need to overcome if we want to work in a really generative mode and create new languages. And I think we really need this generative mode of scholarship and teaching more than ever in part because of um, large language models, actually. I think that critique and applying other people's theories, um, which generally our graduate education does, you know, that's something that I see probably being replaced with um, a model that's trained on all of the previous critique. And so really, if we wanna train our students to have, you know, um, value in the workplace with all of this other stuff going on. It's really in terms of having a generative mode of thinking truly new things. So those are the, the steps I see in terms of um, new goals about how we track climate action. I'm going to finish up by talking a couple of minutes about developing new languages. Um, I think that we've heard a lot of different languages. I'm not going to talk about some of them. I think that most people would agree that sustainability is kind of a, a dead-end term at this point, fully co-opted. Green New Deal, I think, still has some energy. I, I noticed it in the news even in the past day. But um, I wonder about the Fox News effect and the people who have already made associations with it. Um, I think that Femi Taiwo's work on reparations is possibly um, a generative way forward. I'm not going to talk about it today, nor will I talk about just transition, even though I think a lot of us work on that. I'm going to talk about these three other terms instead briefly. Regeneration, I think, caught my interest um, while working in the field, partly because I would talk to, you know, people in Los Angeles that really loved this terminology and idea, but also farmers in Nebraska that were into it. And that was interesting to me. Um, basically, this idea that sustainable is just maintaining the status quo, but regeneration is, you know, moving something bigger. There's obviously a lot of binaries, which you probably noticed by now that I don't like, but um, that's one one way people are narrating this. And I've noticed that, um, you know, when I attend events about regeneration, there's definitely a, a spiritual animation about it. I think that there's things about this narrative that map onto um, maybe familiar Christian ideas about regeneration. Um, that's my observation from the field. 
um, more research is needed. But that's one language that I think could work possibly, um, but it might also have the same fate as sustainability. I'm not sure yet. I think it does meet many of these criteria. Another one I've wondered about is post-extraction or notions of circularity. I did read one research paper that had something like 114 definitions of the circular economy, so I think that's definitely at a state of uh, confusion. But I think it's that you know this does go beyond fossil fuels to address broader things. I think that's really important. Um, I also did note a recent essay from a couple of days ago by Lee Phillips that is uh, you know, attacking the idea of anti-extractivism because he says it's you know, the social relations we should be focusing on rather than um, the extraction part. So you know, read that for a counterpoint, but wanted to throw this on the table for consideration. And finally, the last one I was thinking about more was universal basic energy. So we know that in addition to the climate change crisis, we have um, an energy poverty crisis. Uh, a lot of people without access to electricity, um, slowly getting better, still not enough, um, particularly with the, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and still, you know, the numbers around clean cooking fuels have not budged as much as they should have. So I think that, you know, people in the global south, generally many, many of them need more energy or better energy, cleaner energy. People in the global north are also really concerned about reliability and affordability. This comes up in debates about phase out. Um, we also have the problem that if the global north decarbonizes and just kind of pats themselves on the back for being green, without delivering the climate finance that's promised and investing in clean energy in the global south, we would end up with this two-tiered system of producer nations just selling to nations in the global south. Um, so, you know, I was in conversations about UBX, universal basic whatever, universal basic income services. I said, what about universal basic energy? On a, thinking about that, you know, on different scales, but especially on the global scale, I think it would address some of these challenges. Um, and I couldn't find too much on this. I assumed there would be a lot more writing on this concept because I know the UBX people like to talk about all sorts of things. I found one think tank report about free basic energy in the UK, but um, if anybody wants to write about this more globally, let me know. I'm very interested in that I think it uh, fits all the, the criteria. So just to recap what's been discussed, I think net zero is likely to fade as the main frame for climate policy because of the weaknesses we touched on. I think that it's worth thinking about this as an opportunity to have a new unifying frame. Um, you may well ask, well, why should it be one frame? Why don't we have many? I do think that there are some advantages to having a singular frame, and I do think it's possible since we live in this mimetic society. Um, and I think that the new frame should articulate particular new goals and also be animated by a broader language. So I am eager to discuss all of that with you. All righty. Well, I'm sure there are lots and lots of questions, and we have time uh, to ask and answer them. Neil is scampering around with a microphone. This is really important for the recording, so even if you've got a booming voice, please wait for him. Um, I think we'll, cap we'll grab a couple of questions and throw them to Holly Jean to answer together. But who would like to kick us off? Yeah, Z. It's just for 
Um, so I have a, thank you. I have a question, I think, about the, I'm thinking about the limits and, can you hear me? Um, the, the limits and um, complexities of, I guess, scaling up some of these carbon removal um, practices. The, I think you mentioned plankton and the specific example I'm thinking of is that like we, we might not necessarily be able to scale up the way plankton sinks carbon because um, they do that by forming something called marine snow when there are like just enough nutrients in the water where plankton um, forms these aggregates with like fish poop and marine bacteria and all these things, and then they're able to sink carbon much faster than plankton themselves. But when you have too too much nutrients, then they like form this gelatinous mess, and they're calling it marine snot. And a lot of this research is coming um, from the Mediterranean, where it like poses an aesthetic challenge against local tourism. And so that's where they're um, doing some of this work. And so that's I think one example of like one of these systems where we can't just pump nutrients into the ocean and like assume other organisms would do the work. So can you tell us more about, I think, the, the limits of scaling up um, decarbonization? There's a question over here from Casey. <coughs> run, run. Thank you, um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, uh, first, thank you for being here and talking about net zero and all of the conceptual flaws. I'm very sympathetic to all of that. I would like to ask about um, one topic that I think has remained an elephant in the room, which is militarization across the world, because obviously the militaries, I guess, across the world remain one of the most significant emitters of carbon emissions and much of how modern state functions, which largely you have a lot of the proposals that are meant to deal with the questions of decarbonization or producing a sustainable or renewable or however we'd like to describe it, a different sort of way of utilizing energy, it still mostly operates within the confines of how modern states function, which are ultimately linked to how militaries function and the relationship between state expenditures and military budgets. So I'd like to, I guess, talk about that for a bit. And I guess I'd like to ask about how a different form of energy emission and ecological civilization would incorporate a fundamentally different attitude towards military spending and broadly speaking, global militarization, and especially given the new Cold War with China between the United States and China, which I think at this point kind of exists, how would that complicate all of these factors as well? Hi, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. Um, I read your book uh, after geoengineering it around the same time as Liz, and yeah, it, I, it's one of the very few books I love because it changed my thinking rather than affirming it. Um, so thank you. But um, I just, I would be curious to hear you reflect a little more on what you said about ego being perhaps the biggest challenge to climate action. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I found that I like wrote it down with an exclamation point. So um, yeah, I just love to hear you think a little bit more about the sorts of relationships uh, we might want to cultivate and uh, with each other. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I'll start with the limits to scaling carbon removal. Just by saying that a lot of these technologies are at really different scales of maturity. So. Some of them are fairly well, un I mean, relatively well understood how, how forests work by now because so many people have been studying that over time. But something like ocean fertilization, you know, a few years ago, people had pretty much rejected the idea because of the scientific studies. It's been really interesting to see the career of that as a research topic come back to life. Um, but, I mean, for that, I think we still don't know really basic things about how it, it works, even at a mesoscale, let alone like a global scale. Um, and so I could talk about, you know, the different limits for every single technique, but um, 
just wanted to highlight kind of the diversity of it and that we would be luckily if, lucky if we found a combination that I think could get to one or two or three gigatons through pursuing all of them. And I, I do, I am glad that governments are, you know, investing some research in a lot of different things because we should learn more about all of them, even though we're going to reject half of them at some point. And then um, militarization, I'd love to have more voices in the room on that. I think that it, it's really great that you brought up the relationship between the state expenditures and the military budget because I don't think we can fund all of this stuff we've been talking about and these military budgets. It just it doesn't seem um, feasible. So yeah, obviously we need a, a fundamentally different attitude towards spending. How do we get there? I was wondering at one point earlier in my life if it was possible to change some of these military contractors with their engineering expertise in different directions, in part because Lockheed was investing a lot in things like ocean thermal energy conversion and even some of the kelp stuff. And it was like, okay, do you think we could convince them? Because they're like, you know, it's the revolving door and they have so much lobbying power that could we just shift the budget that way? It's really grim, I know. I hope it, I hope it doesn't come to that sort of a tactic. Um, but then, then we have to work through the voters, right? So that's what we should be doing. Um, and I'm very concerned about the geopolitical situation with China. I don't know what to say or do about it, but I think it's potentially the biggest obstacle to climate action alongside ego. Um, I just wanted to put that in the room because I feel like we don't talk about it and I see it in so many different contexts. I was just working um, for the US government for the past year or so, which was really interesting and inspiring. But even then, even within a large institution, you could see how different egos and different factions were inhibiting the ability of people to work together towards a common goal. Even though everybody was like on paper, all you know, part of the same team, people don't function that way. And I think my personal opinion is that remote work makes it worse in many ways. And I see this you know, obviously in academia, obviously in movements, um, obviously with this media ecology that pushes people into being a, a brand and an influencer even in everyday life. Um, so again, no. No remedies for that. Um, really, I'm sure many of the world's spiritual traditions <laughs> have tackled it. <laughs> but I do think it's something we should talk about more as we try to build a scholarly community. More questions? Um, yeah. Hi, thank you very much. You give us a lot to think about. Um, so, a study that was published a couple of years ago, I think it was, talk about uh, agri the, the global food system contributing about a third of the greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, several years back, I remember uh, La Via Campesina participating. La Via Campesina is a peasant movement, global peasant movement, uh, participating in uh, the uh, the the um, the cop, but you know the the people's cop outside the the real cop, and one of their main slogan was, "Small scale farmers, peasant farmers can cool the planet," uh, making the argument that transforming that that there was a need to transform uh, agriculture, not just the way we produce agriculture, but the whole global food system. No. So I just want you to comment uh, on that. You know, they basically the 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 you you mentioned a little bit about agriculture, but what about the global food system as a whole? And perhaps you could just pass this a little bit behind uh, the gentleman next. Hey, Max. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the the presentation, Holly. Um, I, was, uh, I was a little confused about where you felt uh, political antagonism lies within our climate change discussion. Um, at the end of it, 
uh, you were talking basically, it seemed to me, and perhaps I misunderstood, that you were basically displacing uh, the inherent antagonism that lies in the political sphere in a class society, which obviously we live in, and I believe you must think that if you're using the word capitalism, to this question of egos um, within intellectual production, primarily in the global north. And I, I, I guess I'm left unclear about where exactly political antagonism and class antagonism actually lies in your theory of change because fundamentally these antagonisms are what uh, orient any kind of coalition to change the world and, and I think it seems pretty central when we're talking about strategy we're using words like community we're using words like we and I'm like who is we that are doing things uh, and what is our class orientation to these various things that we want to do great and one more question is the door in the corner there. Yeah, um, sort of related to that, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the rise of like anti-intellectualism and both how that relates to political antagonism within, I'm thinking primarily about American society, but also how that kind of poses a barrier to taking positive steps in relation to climate change and also how that anti-intellectualism could tie into questions of ego specifically within the academy. Well, great. I, I think in terms of um, the agricultural emissions and um, small-scale agriculture to cool the planet, I think that you know more about this than I do, so if you want to share more with everybody, that would be great. I think that obviously in some of these graphs we can see that agricultural emissions are the ones that from this more conventional modeling standpoint that they have left over because they don't know how to address that. So, I mean, one question I have in terms of thinking about can we put different sorts of solutions more explicitly into these models? you may be familiar with if somebody has tried to model well some of these different techniques and approaches um, and represent them kind of spatially and through time quantitatively. Um, I haven't seen that study, but it might well exist because I'm not an agricultural scholar. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I think that it's clear among everybody that I'm in conversation with that we need a massive transformation of the global food system for a number of reasons, everything from nutrition to access to um, emissions to biodiversity to all the things. So um, it's great to be in conversation with people who have expertise in that. Um, in terms of political antagonism, so when I, when I look at U.S. society today, I see, you know, people who in a traditional analysis would be working class, um, but are not maybe allied with their own interests. So what, how do you read that? Do you just say, well, they're, they're in some kind of false consciousness and voting against their interests or what's going on there? Um, I think that, you know, the, the way that our society is set up is the, my theory of change would be more about um, going and talking to people in, in rural communities that I may not have an identity uh, affiliation with or any sort of, uh, different sorts of affiliation with, but they, um, I mean, the, the, the spatiality of this energy situation is that we need to build a lot of stuff in rural areas where uh, people are not feeling the benefits from this, feeling, people are feeling disenfranchised. Um, and so what do you do? I mean, if I have a theory of change, it's to go build coalitions with those people to get out of the cities more and talk to them, find common language. That language may be about justice and fairness. Um, oftentimes, it may be about antagonism towards big corporations. I've seen this, you know, 
in the ag industry, farmers are really frustrated with how these big corporations have been treating them. Um, those sorts of things. Um, and in terms of anti-intellectualism, anti I'm not sure. Like if if it's a if it's a barrier, maybe say more about how that barrier manifests. Um, I don't know. I, I see it as a skepticism, oftentimes well deserved by what the the ways the intellectual class has governed and created policy. Um, and so maybe I'm maybe I'm too sympathetic to it to understand the nature of the barriers that it presents. Thank you for the very thought-provoking talk. I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to go back to the, the the thesis behind your title, which is lenses, you know, to to talk about uh, these kinds of issues uh, post um, net zero, um, and uh, uh, respond to the idea that you put forth, which is this this perspective of regeneration, um, which I st it still strikes me as a um, conservative kind of view, right? Uh, strikes me as a form of restoring, you know, thinking about restoring in some sense what was maybe perhaps the natural order or healthy order of things. Um, I, I come from the, the technology community and uh, the way that um, much of that community I find engages with the world is with the notion of, of invention or creation of a new future, right? Um, and is at odds at some de to some degree with the conservative notion or restorative notion that where we're going, right, somehow should be characterized by some state in the past or similar state in the past. So I wonder if there's some broader notion or other set of ideas that would be more successful engaging that kind of a, a community and energy. By the way, we forgot to ask everyone to identify yourselves when we, sorry about that, but could we start that now just because we're gonna be in dialogue for you know a day, so I'm sorry we didn't mention that earlier. But. If we can start that, I, I know a lot of people have already spoken, but it's too late to do that, but John. Okay. My name is John Vandermeer. I'm from the University of Michigan, and I'm an ecologist. Uh, and actually, I, I raised my hand after you, after you asked your question, because I have a kind of a response to your question, and hopefully the two of them can be answered at the same time. And the agroecological movement, which is really quite different than the restorative agriculture movement, but in the agroecological movement, what we're aiming at is the incorporation of new technologies based on the science of ecology more than anything else. We, we agree that chemistry, physics, and all the other sciences are important also. However, acknowledging that there's an enormous amount of traditional knowledge out there in the world, especially in traditional communities, especially in the global south, and the trick that we feel, the, the trick we feel in the agroecological movement is the way how we can combine those two kinds of knowledges together uh, sort of giving them both equal say in the development of the future society. We agree definitely that we're looking for the future society, but we believe that there's messages in traditional societies and most importantly messages in the way nature works, the ecology of nature, and the trick is to combine those two things together. What do you, uh, my question then is, what do you think about that? <laughs> And perhaps I'll abuse my privilege as chair to ask a question about, uh, well, methods, really. I think that you're such an interesting thinker because your methods are always asking us what comes after, how do we go beyond? Um, and I'd love to, to hear a little bit about what that looks like for you. So you're somebody who combines field work with you know, attending conclaves, I guess, um, but also working with policymakers. So are, are there forms of future forecasting that are not quantitative that you think with? I mean, uh, I think we see that in uh, after geoengineering in particular. And what kind of model do you see about the relationship between the humanities and social sciences and the policy apparatus? Um, and what do, how, how does your work model what that maybe collaboration looks like too? Th 
thank you for your comments on agroecology. I, I think I, I agree. I don't have more to add, but I, I it I'm did. Back yeah. <laughs> No, it, it did resonate this also this comment about the conservatism of regeneration as a frame. I kind of think maybe that's why it works with some of these communities though. It doesn't feel as threatening as innovation or even just plain generation without the prefix. Um, so I think that there's gonna be compromises in these languages and I'm not sure it's my favorite term but I wanted to consider it with the group. The computer's running out of battery. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe, maybe I'll close that. Um, and then in terms of methods, I feel like I haven't had the time yet to explore the methods that I think we could invent. So we have all this amazing technology um, that's used in, in the arts, for example, to explore different worlds, like game engine technology. We have um, a lot of interactive media, and it's almost never used that I've seen to you know, sit down with people and talk about different energy pathways, um, talk, talk with them about what sorts of energy or other sorts of futures they wanna see, and then, you know, have data on hand to, to also talk with them about the implications of, you know, if you want to invest in this approach with your community, what does that mean for X, Y, and Z? We have the tools that we could pretty much in real time answer those questions and build different scenarios with different groups of people. Um, and I, I don't know why it doesn't happen. I, it could just be this disciplinary problem of the people doing public engagement or doing energy modeling, not knowing the people in the media studies and arts world that have some of the tools that could really help to build conversations, build scenarios that are both narrative and quantitative at the same time. We have time for just one last round of questions. Sabina? Thank you. Thank you so much. This was super interesting. Um, I'm just gonna throw this up. So one thing that like we haven't talked about yet is gender. And I kind of want to circle back to the conversation about ego and militarization and thinking about like with the, you know, there's the SDG framing around gender equity, but but if we go a little bit deeper into like this idea of like how maybe masculinity is driving like, you know, decision making about resource use, about how we build cities, about how we design products, and I'm just kind of curious if that's something that you've come up, that's come up in your work where you've looked at sort of gender and how decisions are made and how that might influence the different types of framings and policies. Yep, Naveed. I will have a grand round of... Uh, hi, uh, I'm Naveed Masasabadi Farahani. Uh, I'm like an undergraduate here. Um, and I, I really appreciate your work for its forward looking nature and its real serious engagement with agency and sort of how do we get out of this. Um, one lingering question for me to talk though, um, I think is for me is universal basic energy. I was wondering how you sort of conceive of that as um, resolving the antagonisms um, inherent in moving past net zero, because on first glance, it seems like it might um, heighten those antagonisms. Um, of, for example, the United States opposition to the Kyoto Protocol was over um, its insistence that uh, developing countries could flout the rules. Uh, and and, I, and I, I, I would assume that enshrining this right to a universal basic energy might inspire its own contradictions. So, Wondering if you have any ideas as to rhetorical or political strategies to square this kind of um, circle of underdevelopment. Isabel? Oh, they have lots of hands. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you. Um, so I think I want, I, I really appreciated this chart you put up about binaries that weren't helpful or that were probably problematic and then you thought thought through what they might function as. And I think one of them was technological versus social. Is that, can I confirm? Okay, just to make sure. Um, and I, I guess I was curious to hear you 
talk a little bit more about that binary because I guess I wonder like what it, how do you think about the difference between something that is technological and something that is social, right? What is a technology versus a policy? Like is something a technology in like in some really material way or are there social practices that are themselves technology? I mean, I think I'm just curious about like I know you're not endorsing that binary so this isn't, I guess I just wanted you to speak a little bit more about um, Partly because I think getting back to this anti-intellectualism question and your point about not being overtly anti-capitalist, um, thinking about like where does the resistance come from, and I'm wondering if sometimes resistance comes from a, a particular resistance to things that are seen as technological versus something else. All right. Oh, okay, one, one more bonus question then. And then everyone else, you can absolutely pigeonhole Professor Brooks <laughs> over, a, over a beverage in a second. Well, thank you. I'm Margot Lurie. I'm a doctoral student here. Um, I think my question builds on a number of things that have already been asked this evening, but I think I just wanted to ask more broadly about the role of social transformation in your understanding of net zero, it, because it occurs to me that a lot of these models, and I don't want to suggest that this is your bias because it's built into the models, but they're assuming that energy consumption will continue to grow globally, basically indefinitely, or certainly up until about 20. 100. Um, and so I'm curious, I think the simplest way of phrasing my question is what if energy consumption didn't continue to grow indefinitely? What if there were ways of organizing our social lives and worlds differently in ways that were less energy intensive, particularly in places like the United States, which just lead per capita, you know, global energy consumption by a lot. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my question. Thank you. Yes. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> um, so thinking first about gender, I, I thought about this more in my work some years ago, but it's come back lately because of my, my experience actually in government where Every time I was on a panel about community engagement or community benefit, it would be women on the panel. And everybody I worked with in that space was um, uh, identified as uh, female. And that was really interesting because at the same time, we had no budget for doing this work. And you could really see how it was like the whole social side of talking to people about the stuff that you were going to build you know, basically no budget, and then all of this tech stuff, we're gonna build billions of dollars. It's very stark. Um, and you, you can just see how that reflects, you know, the values of the society. So it, it really, in terms of what kinds of knowledges are privileges, all the, are privileged, the, you know, numbers you get from the research are valued, but the information about what people think, not valued. Um, not sure what to, to do with that observation, except <laughs> keep working on that issue. I think that um, it relates a bit to the, the thought about the technological and social binary and also in terms of social transformation more broadly, because what we see is investing a lot of money in technologies and not investing in the social infrastructure, whether that be, you know, systems of talking with communities and giving them agency to shape what those de deployments are going to look like, being able to incorporate their priorities into projects. Um, that's the part that the tech is not going to work unless you do all of that. I'm not, sh I'm not sure people fully understand that yet. I mean, obviously people in this room do, but the policy, the policy makers. I think they're starting to get there, but um, it may be too late by the time that you know we've institutionalized ways of valuing the, the social dimensions as well. Um, in terms of the, the modeling, you know, I've been referring to that just because it's like the body of literature that's there as a reference point, not because I think it's the best literature. And so I'm actively hoping that we can build out scenarios that have other dimensions and look at different things. I think in terms of energy consumption growth, um, 
a lot of models have the consumption of energy decreasing in places like the US, in part because of energy efficiency gains, but also consumption in other places in the world increasing. And so, for example, Shell has one scenario where they, it's kind of a contraction and convergence model where the US cuts by about half and the rest of the world comes up. And so it's still much more than what we have now, but you know, I'm not saying they should be our model, but unless we have other, other people producing other uh, scenarios, that's, that's, these are like the reference points we have made by these companies. Um, and then the, finally about universal basic energy, thank you so much for your comments and questions on that. Um, I, I think the concerns you raise are really important and worth delving deeper into more than we have time for right now. I do think two advantages I could see to it is that it depends on how you do it. There could be a horrible intervention and there could be a better one. And I think the better one would give the state more latitude to direct clean energy. And I think it would ease people's concerns about not having reliable, accessible energy, which are starting to pop up and I think will grow as climate change gets worse, as we have challenges with things like hydropower supply because of climate change and reliability of the grid because of various lack of maintenance, but also climate change. Um, you know, it'll be very easy for fossil fuel companies to say all of this stuff is not reliable, we can't trust it. Um, and at least, you know, people knowing that they could, they don't have to worry about paying the bills, right, for the cost of this, I think would do a lot. But there's definitely a lot more to think through with the concept. So thank you for that. Well, thank you so much for kicking us off in style. <laughs> thank you.